Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, where I'm helping you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today we're going to talk about coroutines. If you saw the last video, we talked about how to animate text between two numbers. We used a coroutine there. You might ask, why do I need a coroutine? I can just put this in the update function. And most of the time you're right, you can put whatever piece of code you're thinking about writing into the update function or wrap it in some other function and just have a bunch of function calls happen inside of update. That's a way to accomplish the same thing almost, but you end up having a lot of clutter in your class with a bunch of variables to control whether you should or shouldn't update something. And you get a bunch of uh, wasted CPU cycles because you always have to check all of those things every frame because update is called every frame. With the coroutine, you can have something update at a fixed FPS count like we did with the animated text in our last video. And you can also not waste all those CPU cycles by controlling when it starts and when it ends. So that's the primary benefit you get there. There are a bunch of helper classes that allow you to change how long you wait in the coroutine. There's wait for end of frame, wait for fixed update, wait for seconds, wait for seconds real time, wait until, and wait while. And to just wait to the end of frame, you can also just yield return null. Let's hop over and take a look at how to write a coroutine, what the different weights do, and how to manage running coroutines. If we take a look at the Unity documentation for coroutines, there's actually not a lot of information here. They do include the key point of coroutines, which is when you call a function, it typically runs to completion before returning. And that means that everything happening within that function call happens in a single frame, which makes things like animation impossible. That's where coroutines come in. If we take a look at the function here, fade, we can see that it's going to change the color, the alpha specifically of that color, from 1 to 0 over 10 steps, with the ft minus equals 0 0.1 starting at 1 going until ft is less than 0. The problem here is that this happens in a single frame, so the user won't see the material change from visible to invisible over the 10 frames. Instead, the user will just see the material as invisible, so they actually won't see the object at all. If we look down below, with the i enumerator fade, we can see that's the exact same code, except there's an extra line, yield return null. And what that does, in combination with start coroutine, is tells Unity to wait until the end of the frame, and then pick up on the next iteration of the loop. But you don't have to only yield return something inside of the loop. You can use this to do some operations, wait until the next frame, and then do some more operations. So what we'll be doing in this one is exactly the same thing that they were doing on the Unity documentation. We're going to fade alpha of an image using a coroutine, and we'll do all the different kinds of waits, the wait for seconds, wait for seconds real time, wait until, wait while, all of those. We're going to use all of them here, as well as yield return null, so you can see the difference between each of the different waits while we accomplish the exact same goal. So we'll add an image to the scene. We'll create a new script called fade alpha, We'll open up Visual Studio, we'll delete some of the stuff that Unity gives us by default, and what we're going to do first is make it so this fade alpha script will work on an image, so we can have to attach it to an image component, or it will add the Unity UI image to the component by adding this require component type of image at the top. Since we require the component of image, on awake what we'll do is assign a private image image by doing git component image. And what that does is just prevents us from having to assign the image in the inspector for each time that we attach this fade alpha. If you make it public image image instead, you can just drag the reference in the inspector, but this saves you some work. This isn't a video about the life cycle of a mono behavior, but just for reference, awake happens first, start happens later. So we will guarantee that by the time start happens, our image will already be assigned. So in start, what we're going to do is call a function called fade out alpha, and this will just the exact same thing we just saw on the Unity documentation. It's going to lerp the image alpha from 1 to 0. We're going to make it take 100 steps instead of 10 because 10 is very fast, and we'll just we'll show what happens in the profiler actually here.
So if we hop back over to the Unity editor and we click play with this attached to that image, you see that we don't see an image at all. Like I was saying in the documentation overview, it happens on the first frame, so we don't see anything at all. If we look at the profiler, we'll see that it executes. It takes some amount of time longer than it should because we're executing 100 iterations of a loop. And then all the rest of the frames, it's not there because it happens only on the first frame. Let's change this code to use a coroutine. So we'll actually see this image fade from fully visible to invisible over some period of time. We'll hop back over to Visual Studio and change the fade out alpha to return an I enumerator. That's a requirement for all coroutines. Anytime you're going to write one, it must return I enumerator. And that comes from the system collections namespace. The other important part is that we yield return null. We'll get into what else you can return later, but yield return null makes it so Unity will wait until the next frame before picking up the execution of this loop that we're in right now. Since our loop runs 100 times by decrementing alpha from 1 to 0 by 0 0.01, this will take 100 frames to execute. If we set application target frame rate to 33, that means it'll take about three seconds for this to go from fully visible to invisible. The last important piece here is that we actually start the coroutine. If we just call fade out alpha, it'll only execute one iteration of our loop. That's why we have to call start coroutine. That tells Unity that this will return something and we need to pick up execution again later. If we hop back over to the Unity editor and click play, we'll see the image fade out slowly over three seconds. If we take another look at the profiler, we'll see that fade out is called every frame until it's completely faded out, and then it's not called anymore. It's that easy to convert your function from the normal function to a coroutine. Like I said earlier, there's many different ways to wait in a coroutine though. We use the most simple one, yield return null, which is just waiting for the next frame. Now let's go through what each of the different waits do and how they operate differently. If we again pull up the Unity documentation, we can see that there are several different waits. Wait for end of frame, wait for fixed update, wait for seconds, wait for seconds real time, wait until, and wait while. As I said earlier, wait for end of frame is basically the same as return, yield returning null, so we'll skip over that one for now. The one that I find most valuable is wait for seconds, so let's start there. I use this one the most because it allows you to animate something at a fixed FPS count. Let's see how to use it. At the top of the coroutine, we'll define wait for seconds, wait equals new wait for seconds. We'll make it animate maybe at 30 FPS, so we'll put 1 divided by 30 F to make sure that we don't do integer division, and then we'll yield return wait. You might ask, why do we define wait for seconds above and why can't I just return yield return new wait for seconds? There's two reasons for that. One is you have to calculate the one divided by 30 each time. And the other one is actually creating a new wait for seconds generates a little bit of garbage. So if we yield return new wait for seconds, every frame that it executes on, there will be some garbage generated. And we'll show that in the inspector right now we see that this takes much longer to fade out. And if we go to the profiler, we'll see that not every frame this coroutine executes. If we slowly drag across, we'll see it's about every other frame. And if we drill in onto the fade alpha part, we'll see that there's some GC alloc, which is garbage that's generated every time that this executes, which ends up in this case being almost every other frame. If we quickly undo what we just did and define wait for seconds at the top of the coroutine again, head back to the editor, click play, and check out the profiler again, we'll see there's garbage when the coroutine first starts, but not again throughout the execution of the coroutine. That 20 bytes of GC alloc are gone. If we take a look at the Unity documentation again, we can see that wait for seconds and wait for seconds real time are very similar. The only difference is wait for seconds uses the time.timescale, and wait for seconds real time does not, meaning that wait for seconds uses scaled time, and wait for seconds real time will wait for seconds real time. Personally, I've never changed the timescale of my game. I've never had a need to do that if you don't know what that means at all probably you can stick with wait for seconds. That's the only one I used in my games. What I'm going to do is add use real time wait to the top of the fade alpha class. 
And I'm just going to copy paste the code we were just using surrounded by this if use real time wait. And if we're going to use real time wait, I will use wait for seconds real time. Otherwise, I will use the wait for seconds that we just used. Code's the exact same, but we will set the time.timescale to be 0.5, so it runs at half speed. And we'll see that wait for seconds takes twice as long, approximately, as wait for seconds real time. I'm going to quickly duplicate this image, move them around a little bit, and title one real time, one of them scaled, just to quickly show the difference between the two weights here. I will also now mark the one on the left as the real time wait, so I'll check this box and we'll click play and we'll watch that wait for seconds real time goes approximately twice as fast as wait for seconds because we're using the half time scale here. If we look closely at the profiler, we'll see two coroutines, one fade out alpha using system collections I enumerator get current, and one of them is using custom yield instruction. Wait for seconds real time is a custom yield instruction. And we'll notice wait for seconds real time executes less than the wait for seconds scaled time one. The next two weights we're going to talk about are wait and tell and wait while. These work opposite of one another. Wait and tell suspends the coroutine execution until the supply delegate evaluates to true, while wait while does the opposite. It suspends it until the delegate evaluates to false. Another key piece here is that the supply delegate will be executed each frame after update, but before late update. Another cool thing is the delegate function you provide does not generate garbage each frame. What we're going to do to show these two weights is we'll create a new script called fade alpha with target, and we'll set it up almost exactly the same as just the fade alpha we were just using where we put an image that we get on awake, we assign that on awake, and on start, we'll start the coroutine. But this time, what we're going to do is add a dependency image. And what we'll do is wait until or wait while based on the alpha of this image. So we can wait while this particular dependency image is visible or wait until it is invisible. One thing here is the alpha is never less than or equal to zero, so I'm going to provide a really small number in a second instead of zero, because with zero it, it just doesn't work when we use the less than or equal to. Since these two are opposites, what I'll do is flip the condition on wait until and wait while, so they will both behave the exact same, even though we're providing a different condition on each one. If you're following along, remember to change this less than or equal to to something really small, maybe 0.01f, just to make sure that it will actually hit this condition as true. What I'm going to do now is fast forward a little bit, and what I'm doing in the inspector is just duplicating the images that I have for real time and scale time weights, replacing that fade alpha script with the new fade alpha with target script, and assign the dependency image to be the image above it. So wait while will depend on real time, and wait until will depend on scaled time. So as soon as real time becomes invisible, wait while will start fading out. As soon as scaled time fades out, wait until will also start to fade out. After we click play, we can see that wait while starts fading out after real time has fully faded out, and wait until actually hasn't started. We paused it right as it should start. If we take a look at the profiler, we can see that fade alpha with target has two executions running, the wait while and wait until neither of which are generating any garbage, and both are executing every frame. Throughout the duration of the coroutine execution on fade alpha with target, there is no garbage. Towards the end, we can see fade alpha with target is using the standard system collections I enumerator get current return because we did yield return null while it's fading, so it will update every frame. The final wait we'll talk about is wait for fixed update. This one is pretty self-explanatory. It waits for the next fixed update call. And I think we'll show this by just logging some information so we can see the order that it executes because fixed update typically happens very quickly and it'll be challenging to see the wait that happens there. This is useful if you need to wait in a coroutine for some physics to happen, because physics typically happens in fixed update. 
So I'll make a new class called fade waiting for fixed update. We're going to copy paste again the fade out alpha. It's going to do the exact same thing all the other ones have done, except we will use wait for fixed update. We'll define that again at the top of the code routine. We'll also include the fixed update function, which Unity will call automatically. And we'll just add some logging here, one right before we wait that says waiting for fixed update will yield return the wait. Then we'll log fixed update completed. And in fixed update, every tick we will log fixed update. This way, whenever we press play, we can check out the console logs and we'll see which one happens in what order. And let's just add the number that I would expect you to see them. One, two, three. Heading back to the Unity editor, Let's just duplicate this wait and tell image and we will replace the script with the new one we just created. We will click play and we'll see, since we did it on start, we'll see one waiting for fixed update, two fixed update, three fixed update completed. And we'll see that happen a whole bunch of times until wait and tell is gone. And then we will only see two fixed update because the coroutine has ended. We won't get the one and three logs anymore. The last thing we're going to talk about with coroutines is how to manage running coroutines. So far, we've just started the coroutine. But what happens if we want to stop that coroutine and start a different one instead, or stop all coroutines running on this mono behavior? The second one is easy. There's a function that comes on all mono behaviors called stop all coroutines. Just call that and all coroutines will stop. If you only have one coroutine running, you can use this as well to stop that coroutine. For more nuanced, complex behaviors with coroutines, you will actually want to store a reference to the coroutine that's returned by start coroutine. To see how this works, we'll add two buttons to the UI using the on GUI function on the mono behavior, one that will stop fading and one that will start fading. And notice a small change here is we will store the return of start coroutine into our class member variable coroutine. This gives us a reference to the coroutine that's running so we can stop it later. We will also remove the start coroutine from automatically happening on start and make that a function just start fading. That way the image will not start fading until we click start fading. Let's hop back over to the Unity editor to see this in action. If I click play, I will see that the image does not start fading immediately. When I click start fading, the image starts fading out. If I click stop fading before it's completed, we'll notice that the animation stops immediately. If I click start fading again, since we start the loop at one, the image will abruptly change from whatever alpha it was at to fully opaque and start fading back down to zero. I hope you got a lot of value out of this video. And I hope it demystified what coroutines are and how to use them for you. I know in my first game, I spent 28 months working on it, and I didn't write a single coroutine the entire time. There were so many inefficiencies there. So I hope that this helps you not make the same mistakes that I made. If you have any suggestions, if you have a topic that you'd like me to cover, or even if you implement coroutines in your game as a result of watching this video, drop a comment down below. And I'll see you on the next video.